Welcome to the Metta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and today I'm speaking with a close friend, Jerry Colonna. Jerry's the CEO and co-founder of Reboot.io, an executive coaching and leadership development firm dedicated to the notion that better humans make better leaders. For nearly 20 years, he's used the knowledge gained as an investor, an executive, and a board member for more than 100 organizations <laughs> to help entrepreneurs and others to lead with humanity, resilience, and equanimity. His first book, Reboot, Leadership in the Art of Growing Up, is available on June 18th, 2019, and includes a foreword written by me. Welcome to the Meta Hour podcast, Jerry. Oh, thank you, Sharon. You know, it, it's, it's, um, it's odd hearing you read that bio. I bet. <laughs> because this is just Jer Jerry and Sharon. That's right. We're just hanging out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does .io mean? What is that? Uh, well, uh, it was because .com was not available. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it stands for, the, it's a domain level for uh, Indian Ocean. But we thought it was kind of fun because we always play with this notion of rebooting the operating system. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You have been a board member for more than 100 organizations? I have. Um, wow. That's the battle scars that I wear. Wow. And, and of course, the ones that are most challenging are the uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, <yeah clears throat> Buddhist organization. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have a few I can, I can talk to you about. <laughs> oh, well, that's really true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's, there's actually something to that. I mean, there, there's uh, what I often say is that those organizations that are intentional mm -hmm. in their efforts um, are very, very tricky. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carl Jung used to say that the closer to the light you get, the deeper the shadow. And interesting. And there can be a lot of tricky mm -hmm. human dynamics that flow when we all sort of meditate on the light. Right. And right, kind of deny that that more difficult part of our human nature. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, the way I thought of it is that um, sometimes values-based organizations... Yeah. Um, have a really hard time manifesting in this world, yeah. And trying to see, well, what's the what's the authentic expression of what we care about, and yeah. can we not hold on to the concept so rigidly, but really find what's what's relevant? So, for example, I, I remember a friend of mine was on the board of a school. Um, private school, but one that was very much um, values-based, like Quaker-based. Mm -hmm. And um, many times people would stand up in some meeting and say, fundraising is not a Quaker value. Yeah. I don't think we should do fundraising. Yeah. And he quoted the, I guess, president um, standing up and saying, but inclusion is. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can have a diverse population here Mm. is if we do some fundraising, mm. Mm. you know? And so trying to see where the reality lies and, mm. and how you're going to live in this world, in this society, mm. um, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the way I approach it, and, and you know, my lineage uh, goes back to Trumpa Rinpoche um, by way of a number of different teachers. Um, and so we, I was schooled in the notion of the warrior and the warrior stance. And I know Roshi Joan speaks of this oftentimes as well. The notion of the strong back and open heart is super powerful. It's really important. I mean, it's true both in the work I do with my clients, but it's true in these kinds of organizations. And I think that one of the ways that um, these enlightened organizations may uh, create uh, unnecessary suffering is that they lean too much into one side, perhaps the open heart. And what they may at times fail to understand is that the strong back of fiscal discipline, of good structure, of good process, actually creates the opportunity for the open heart. 
right? You need actually this combination of both. And to stand in that place is really, really hard. It's hard for organizations and it's hard for ourselves as individuals. So I will often call upon the warrior stance when I'm either working with an organization or certainly working with an individual mm -hmm. in that regard. Do you think, uh, it seems that money is one of those oh, arenas. <laughs> money. I wish everyone uh, could see your face right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just one of those places like, yeah. like power. Yeah. You yeah. know, that uh, it's so tricky. Yeah. Like, is it okay to have money? Like a lot of people think not. Well, you know, I mean, at the risk of doing that thing that people on podcasts do, as I say in my book. Yeah. Um, Yes, that's so <laughs> well. You know, in in the, the the reason I bring it up is because um, I purposefully began talking about money in the first chapter, because that's the topic that really it it it, it, it drives so much of the unconscious troublemaking that we do, um, and I think for most people, first of all, I think for most people. Money is a proxy for safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, because we, someone like myself, may not have grown up with the sense of safety, the way, uh, the way for example, with, with myself, I grew up um, with a significant amount of chaos at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you and I have talked plenty of times about the chaos I grew up with. My mother was mentally ill. My my father was alcoholic, and there was just a tremendous amount of poverty and turmoil in the household. Some implicit violence, if not explicit violence. And early on, I internalized the notion of safety at my grandparents' house. And the thing that I associated with my grandparents was that my grandfather was an entrepreneur way back when, right? Sixth grade education, but he was an entrepreneur as in an ice man in Brooklyn, which always felt like, but it always felt like he had enough mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. And the symbol that I internalized was that uh, in the pantry just outside of the kitchen, there was uh, a green doored pantry that always had lemon drops in a tin. And for me, lemon drops became associated with money, which became associated with safety. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that money, the, the, the issues around money are really, really powerful. First of all, we live in a society that tends to associate money with self-worth, mm -hmm. which is just heartbreaking. But we also have this notion of safety that I was talking to. And I think that the way we try to explore that, and this is true for organizations as well as individuals, is to really, um, we can talk about money, but we should talk about the need for safety. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the countervailing forces to, is to ask oneself one's, this question, do I have enough? Like the notion of enough isn't, mm -hmm. in my mind, well explored enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that, in my experience with the teachings, um, there is that notion of enough, of having clear discernment about what is enough and are you enough. So anyway, it's a long-winded rant on no, it's fantastic. On, I mean, it's, on money, it's quite a topic. Yeah, um, because you know, I also, um, of course, think about the roots of generosity, which mm -hmm. seem, in, in you know, in the Buddhist context, ideally come from a sense of inner abundance or in a sufficiency, and that's why some very poor people, relatively speaking, by external measures, might be very generous, mm -hmm. whereas some very, very wealthy people don't have an inner feeling ever of having enough, and so it's very difficult for them to give. You know, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. kind of a painful process. And, and so looking at that question of enough and inner sufficiency and, uh, is really about looking how at how we're able to give an offer and share mm. with others. And it's, it's very important. You know, I, I have this image and, and I hesitate, or I have this memory and I hesitate to share it because I don't want to present myself in a particular way mm -hmm. as particularly evolved in any way because I struggle every single day. But um, when I was a young man in my early 20s 
and I was working three jobs and um, trying to trying to pay for college and trying to balance all these things. I remember one time I left my apartment in uh, in Brooklyn and I was headed to the train to go to work. And this young kid came by and he said to me, um, hey, mister, I'm cold. And it just stopped me in my tracks. And I took him back into my apartment. I made him the can of soup that I had. And then I gave him uh, the sweater and the knitted cap that my grandmother had made for me. And to this day, I don't know if he was really hungry and cold. In my heart, he was. Mm -hmm. And in my heart, I did that. And I had nothing. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't mean to put myself mm -hmm. in that position mm -hmm. of those who just, you know, it was my last shirt. And mm -hmm. it. Because, you know, I'm a white man of privilege, right? I was fine. But I will tell you that um, when I get scared about money, when I get scared about having enough, when I worry about being safe, I remember the times in which I have reached down deep and I have given, even though I was scared. Mm -hmm. And the gift that has come back to yeah. me in that moment yeah. um, has really quieted those fears. Yeah, because we really don't regret it in we truth. We never you know? regret it. Yeah. We don't, how could, I mean, what are we saying? Would we regret compassion? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Far out. <laughs> <laughs> I regret being kind. <laughs> Maybe, but let's take a closer look. Well, I think the, the, the corollary to that is that sometimes we are taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and, and again, this enters into money, right? Um, you know, am I going to be taken advantage of? But I think, I mean, you know, you're my teacher. You, mm -hmm. You've taught me more than anything that if you can approach those moments with discernment yeah, and even a little bit of loving kindness and forgiveness for oneself, if one has been taken advantage mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. and understand that you're going to be okay, yeah, even after all of that, then okay. One of my teachers, uh, this man named Meninger, was very, um, he was very slight and airy. He looked like Gandhi, sort mm -hmm. of, and wore all white, and he would just sort of trip around, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, he used to go to the marketplace in India and bargain fiercely over, like, peanuts or, you know, whatever he was <laughs> buying that day, oranges or something. And, and we used to sometimes look at him, like, pretty skeptically like what are you doing you know like you're aren't you supposed to be detached you know and mm. kind of above it all and, and he'd say the purpose of the dharma the purpose of the teachings is to be simple and easy about things not to be a simpleton <laughs> you know and i was like okay i guess it's okay to draw the line and bargain and you know try not to be taken advantage of yeah. but yeah you know it's from such a different heart space when you realize, I mean, there are people who are cold and hungry, and it's kind of incredible. Yeah, yeah. You know that? Yeah. How can that be that we just live in the midst of that? And it's, you know. I, I think so, so many of our decisions about these sorts of things kind of break one way or the other. Do you believe that people are fundamentally good? Mm -hmm. If you believe that people are fundamentally bad and need redemption and salvation— then you will be on guard and you will probably be ungenerous. But if you believe that people are fundamentally good, even if they act in ways that are hurtful, then uh, I think the impulse is to overcome your own fears and to reach out and to do what you can to be kind. Mm-hmm. I want to go back, actually, to something you said earlier, because I think it was so important. Um, <clears throat> when we think we want something, maybe we have to look deeper. Like, we think we want money. We want piles of money. Mm. But we really maybe want safety or security or leisure time or a sense of freedom. We want something that that money symbolizes. And if we just stay on the surface of things, um, we're not going to find that. And and we're just going to go round and round and round seeking what we actually don't want. Yeah, yeah. And it's very hard, even in spiritual contexts where uh, we look 
perhaps look down on desire a little bit, like I shouldn't want anything. Yeah. You know, rather than realizing, well, we do want, let's see what we really want. Yeah. And that that's a path all in and of itself to make that kind of inquiry. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you know that my favorite term is this notion of radical self-inquiry. And um, it's a term I coined to, to really respond to and um, a call to try to look more deeply into things. And I, because I, I like to simplify things to make it easier for me to make sense of the world, I think that we tend as children to be organized for the pursuit of one of three things, love, safety, or belonging. Mm -hmm. And you could argue that all are wrapped up in each other, right? If I feel like I belong, I feel safe and I feel loved mm -hmm. and I feel the capacity to love. But understanding things, understanding our own behavior and those around us within the context of the pursuit of love, safety, and belonging, I think can be really powerful. And when you ask yourself what I describe as radically self-inquiring questions like, what is this fear about money really about? Where does it stem from? What is my relationship to safety, for example? What is my relationship to these sort of wishes? And where did it come from? Then it gives you the possibility to, a to ask a different set of questions and a, a sort of forward-looking question that might be something like, is there another way for me to feel safe? Mm -hmm. Right. If, if, and you know, when I think, when I think of that kind of question, um, and I think of my own struggles with that, right. Oh my, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose money. So therefore, what am I really feeling? I'm feeling safety. Uh Oh, I'm being thrust back into my childhood where I have to deal with the complications and implications of poverty and shame. Breathe. Is there another way that I might feel safe? Then what happens, and it's happening even now, all of a sudden images of my friends come to mind. Mm -hmm. And then I say to myself, well, wait a minute. I have friends. I belong. I'm going to be okay. And in fact, one of the great gifts of community is that when someone who I love is in need, I'm able to step in and help take care of them. And all of a sudden, there's this gorgeous uh, experience of community and love and belonging that just calms the fear about safety. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does that resonate yeah, at all? Yeah, totally. I mean, you used the word privilege earlier, and mm. I often think of privilege as an assumed sense of belonging. You know, rather than going into a certain space and sort of checking it out, like, do I really belong here? Or maybe yeah. no one else thinks I belong here. Or, yeah. you know, can I prove that I belong here? And that sort of yeah. overriding need to be enough, you know, and look yeah. like enough. And um, But just to walk in and just have that be the assumption, like, I belong here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That yeah. That's what privilege actually is. I, I thank you for that. I, I, I see that. I see that. And, and, and that the experience of being in a privileged position is the experience to not have your belonging question. Yeah. To not be othered. Yeah. 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 Hmm. And here we are, you know, um, I love the term reboot um, oh. <laughs> because uh, it reminds me of being in the car with a GPS saying recalculating. Like, you <laughs> dummy, you took a wrong turn. <laughs> recalculating. Like, okay. It, it makes me feel like it's not hopeless, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a play on words. And, you know, I have this um, history of relationship with the technology industry. And, and so the notion of rebooting the system was always uh, uh, something powerful for us. And um, in this case, in the, in the book's case, it really um, speaks to that moment in one's life or the moment in my life where I had to hit the reboot button. Mm -hmm. And I had, because the, because the system had just frozen and there was no way that I was going to move forward from where I was. Mm -hmm. And so being able to hit that button and move to a new space was incredibly important. 
Don't you see? I feel like I see, and I'm mm. uh, I'm wondering, you know, your various roles, like in your life and and in your work. Um, it seems to me that younger people, not always, but often, have tools that I don't feel I had. Hmm. You know that um, uh, they've kind of grown up in a sense, either being able to find community with one another, hmm. or um, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, having a certain sense of the innate dignity that is that is within them. Hmm. You know that they should be treated well. That they shouldn't shouldn't be. Oh, and then we might then interpret negatively as an entitlement. Yeah, well, we might. You uh-huh. know, and of course, could be also mm-hmm. that. But I, I think there's there's often something positive, like um, when you know I've had young people, for example, um, hearing certain aspects of the Buddhist teaching, uh-huh. saying that doesn't make sense to me. You know, how does that integrate into life? You know, why should I think of that just as a philosophical tenet? Mm. You know, that's got to be real. How does that work? Mm. You know, when you're, you know, when when they say something like, um, oh, the Buddha said, you know, uh, even if you were to get torn apart limb from limb, if you were to harbor a moment of anger, you were no student of my teaching, you know? Uh. And then, uh, which is a interesting and powerful and beautiful statement and then uh i notice that every time i'm doing something about loving kindness for all yeah you know somebody will write to me and say well why should i have loving kindness that person doesn't think i should exist because i'm trans or because i'm gay or right because i'm different and, right you know um why should i you know make this real this isn't just a, a kind of religious exercise you know what does that mean in my life where i'm castigated and i'm put down and shoved aside, you know, make this real. And and I just think that's a remarkable quality. I think I think it's remarkable and I think that there's a powerful truth in what they're asking. Um, because um that is so much a part of the experience that people have. Um and it's not enough to I think to be able to just sort of say, you know, that old Christian um, belief system of turn the other cheek and um, I, I think that and I'm just stepping into an empathetic place of what does it feel like to be annihilated? What does mm-hmm, it feel like mm-hmm. to be wiped out? What does it feel like to feel um, personal existential threat? Mm-hmm. where your personhood is under attack. And again, I will recognize that as a white cisgendered male, um, I do not live with that existential mm-hmm. threat mm-hmm. that my brothers and sisters and non-binary folks, however they identify, mm-hmm. might be feeling. And yet, I have suffered the violence. Mm-hmm. I think that there is something powerful in being able to um, recognize that suffering exists separate and above and beyond that individual Mm -hmm. who is inflicting the violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, our mutual friend Parker Palmer likes to say that violence is what we do when we don't know what to do with our suffering. Mm -hmm. Um, In the moment, it's not a particularly useful teaching if we are suffering violence mm-hmm. in that sort. But when one of the after effects of violence is self-denigration and hatred and anger, can be. And to recognize the universality of that suffering and to reach deep inside and find some place of connection, not necessarily with the perpetrator, but with others who mm-hmm. who have suffered that violence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's um, there's some relief from your own suffering mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in that connection with others. Mm-hmm. But um, this is this is an edgy place for me where I am still a profound work in progress. Mm-hmm. Well, we all are, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think that that's very real. Yeah, it, it's tied in, you know. Um, 
when I think about younger people and um, although, you know, like I start, I helped start IMS when I was 23, mm-hmm. you know, so how young is young? <laughs> um, but not that I knew what I was doing, but uh, no. <laughs> um, I think about that insistence on authenticity and integration, which is the positive part. And then I also think about anxiety. So now I'm thinking about young entrepreneurs and yeah. people that you're you're counseling and, and what seems to be really an epidemic of anxiety. Yeah. Um, at IMS, at the Insight Meditation Society, when someone is coming for a retreat, when they've arrived or in, in cases of long retreats before they arrive, um, they fill out like an informational sheet, which mm. includes um, the... Uh, drugs they may be taking, you mm-hmm. know, pharmaceuticals, um, just so that people know, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, or if they're seeing a therapist, something like that. And um, I was once going through these forms for a retreat, and um, it said, you know, anxiety disorder, anxiety disorder, anxiety disorder, anxiety disorder. And I said, I looked up and I said, what happened to all the depressed people? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like that's what it used to say. Yeah. And and it just really feels like an epidemic, you know, that all of our angst is kind of being channeled. Yeah. Maybe not all of it, but quite a lot of it is being channeled into this overriding anxiety and people are trying to grapple with it. And and I think about being a young entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, having that. Yeah. And, and yet trying to, you know, do something successful or make an impact. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when we talk about the, the pervasiveness of anxiety and, and you're right, young entrepreneurs, but young leaders, those who take a, you know, responsibility for the well-being of others. I, I, I have yet to find a, a cohort that doesn't have some pervasive anxiety. Mm-hmm, in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to me, it leads, it, it begs the larger question of what the heck is going on. Mm-hmm. And I have some theories. And one theory is that, um, there's this um it, i think it, it it's rooted into that in, in that notion of whether or not we're worthy enough mm-hmm. um when i am at my most anxious uh, it tends to uh follow a particular storyline that uh is connected to a particular existential threat and the threat is almost always ends up with me being unloved, thrust out, mm-hmm. no longer belonging, and then therefore not safe. And so if we're talking about an entrepreneur, and we might be talking about failure, failure of the enterprise. Mm-hmm. Now, logically, um, an enterprise, a new business is kind of an art project. Um, in 20 years of investing, I never invested in a company that actually perfectly executed on its business plan. Just like an artist begins to execute on a painting and it doesn't quite turn out the way they thought it was, Mm -hmm. or a musician with a song. And yet we don't think of it as an art project. We think of it as a do or die kind of situation. And I think what's happening is that when we are merging our sense of self with the with the the accomplishment of a goal, when we merge our sense of uh, worthiness with achieving some predetermined outcome, whether I'm getting an A in the class, whether I'm fundraising enough, whether for my my business venture, whether my job is going to be a success. When we merge our sense of self with the externalized object, we open ourselves up to the plague of anxiety. Whereas, you know, if we if, if, if we can, let's talk about the opposite, right? Which might be considered equanimity. And to me, the equanimity gets defined as Life is going at, in completely unpredictable and unexpected ways, and I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just like that. Life did not turn out the way I anticipated, and I'm okay. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm okay regardless of how those external circumstances mm-hmm. turned out. Mm-hmm. 
And I'm not talking about physical safety now. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about that, that dukkha, mm -hmm. that existential yeah. suffering. Yeah, yeah. The me, the big me, the persona, the ego, whatever term we want to use, it's sort of out there. When that's threatened, to me, that's the biggest source of anxiety. Yeah. I mean, and, and for evidence, I will point to the very well documented and common phenomena that when you're driving and all of a sudden something um, truly dangerous happens, you actually don't get anxious. You get focused mm -hmm. because the risk is so mm -hmm. profound and real. It's right there. It's only afterwards when you relive it <laughs> mm -hmm. that the anxiety starts to go on and on. Yeah. Interesting. You know, in the teachings, um, as you know, equanimity is like the voice of wisdom. Right. You know, so, and the particular wisdom that's talked about is often in terms of the eight vicissitudes of pleasure and pain and gain and loss and praise and blame and fame and disrepute, and that this is just the stuff of life. It's ungovernable. And it's not the case that you're going to be able to produce the perfect thing. Yeah. And every single human being on earth is going to praise you. And and it, and it will stay permanent like that. And, or that it will be permanent. I mean, you know, what we're really talking about is anxiety that comes from impermanence. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Ani Pema, uh, I, I once read in one, her, one of her books that she was talking about the fear of uncertainty being linked to this notion around impermanence. And we confusedly say that we fear death when really what she was teaching is we fear life. Mm-hmm. Because you cannot have life that is permanently sealed in amber. Our children grow up, mm -hmm. right? My youngest, Michael, shout out to Michael, is 22 today. Mm -hmm. Yay, happy birthday, Michael. Happy birthday, Michael. But, you know, yeah. I would want him to stay eight years old forever. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, of course, that's actually not life. Yeah. And so... You know, in some ways, I guess anxiety is rooted in that um, can't everything just stay exactly the way it is forever and ever and ever, and then I will feel safe? Right. And, it, and the answer is no. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah, and it's not a sign of personal failure that um, that things change or that we experience both sides, the pleasure and the pain. That's right. You know, that the the gain and loss and the praise and the blame. And I mean, it's not, you know, I don't mean to be dismissive of feedback or something like that and make it sound like, well, I don't care, you know. Praise and blame are one to me. It's not really like that. Uh, there are things to learn from people's comments and, and so sure. on. But um, the ways we take it to heart and the ways we uh, define ourselves, um, you know, next year... Uh, Congratulations on your book. Massive oh, congratulations. Next year is the 25th anniversary of my first book, Loving Kindness. Oh, and uh, thank you. And uh, a book I still go back to. Time thank and time you. Again. So I have, I have many stories about that book in terms of praise and blame. Uh, the one I usually tell um, has to do with soon after it came out. I was in California, so almost 25 years ago, and I had lunch with somebody in. And she said to me, oh, Sharon, you wrote that book in such a way, it's, it's just like sitting down and having a conversation with you. It's just like being with you. And I was so thrilled. Mm -hmm. And as a comment that that night, I was having dinner with a whole other group of people, and I brought up the comment, and someone said, well, that's not true. <laughs> she said, I'm reading the book. It doesn't sound anything like you. It's nothing like being with you. And I thought, oh, you know, you can be ecstatic at lunch and yeah. depressed at dinner, or you can take a moment and realize it's the same book. It's the same book. You know, and, and of and course, there are things two to, different experiences. That's right. And there yeah. are things to learn and listen. But, you know, it's so easy to just define oneself, mm. by, especially by that negative comment. Mm. Not the positive one, mm. but the negative one. And, mm. and to be overcome by it. Mm. And could have been my last book because mm -hmm. that's a discouraging notion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How did you um, how did you move from that spot to write the next book? In the to write the next book, um, I had a, a strong desire to write a book on faith, mm -hmm. and um, 
I wrote a book in between, uh, which was The Heart as Wide as the World, which was sort of a collection of stories. And and then I wrote a book, um, yet another book. I didn't really write it. I, I pulled it together. It was a benefit book for Ramdas mm-hmm. when he had the stroke. So every then teacher at IMS contributed a chapter and and I edited it and it became Voices of Insight. So mm-hmm. then the tables were clear, you know, and mm-hmm. it was like a burning desire. I had to write that book. Which one? On faith. faith. Mm-hmm. I just had to do it. And there were a lot of obstacles and mm-hmm. um, uh, people losing faith in me because I, I sort of lost my way in trying to do it. And uh and yet, I, it was just something so deep in me. I just had to do it. So well, and that's um, that's the book that connects us, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. So should I tell that story? Sure. <laughs> so um, Sharon and I, we first met right when our mutual friend Jeff Walker invited us both to a dinner, and um, as his his wont, he gave the whole table a question to ask and. I don't remember the question, but I ended up sharing uh, the importance that that book, Faith, had for me. And to put it succinctly, in uh, February 2002, I was struggling mightily with a deep, deep depression. And um, I was suicidal. And this was no joke. It never is a joke. But um, having had one suicide attempt when I was 18 the statistics show that it's highly likely that I might have been a successful suicide. And uh, among the, the, the three books that made a difference in my life were Parker Palmer's Let Your Life Speak, Pema Chodron's When Things Fall Apart, and Faith. And uh, when the conversation turned to me, I, of course, burst into tears as I usually do, and I started talking about the, what faith meant to me the book. And, um, and I remember your reaction, which was that it was one of the hardest books you mm-hmm. ever had to write. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that, um, the reason I think back now to why I think it was, well, I hear your voice in loving kindness and I hear yeah. your voice in so many of your books. I felt your suffering mm-hmm. in faith mm-hmm. and in feeling your suffering. I felt companionship. Mm -hmm. I felt humanity. I felt not alone. Mm -hmm. And I could tell myself, well, if this person is okay, then I will be okay. Mm. And that, that little flip made all the difference in the world for me. So Jerry's sitting there and crying, and I'm sitting there crying. <laughs> now I feel like crying again. Um, That's my pheromone. It's what I do. <laughs> you may be good at that. <laughs> no, it was, I'm surprised I qualified by saying it was one of the hardest things I've written. It was the hardest thing I've written yeah. um, to this day, and because it was so personal. Um, yeah. um, and that was part of the way I had lost my way in that it was, I was struggling with the topic and the things I was writing were very kind of elevated, you know, and abstract. And uh, it was only when I I signed a new contract for the book that somebody said to me, it really has to be your story. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, Um, so it is, it's like my story. And then I want to commend you for your book, this current book and credible vulnerability and honesty and, uh, you're right there, you know, it is your story and and that's not easy. You uh, know, I I appreciate that. I think that, you know, to go back to faith for a moment and then, and then respond to the, to your observation, I, I, I think you were a warrior in that book. I think you held your back straight as a ramrod but your heart stayed Mm -hmm. open Mm -hmm. and it hurt and when i think about the process of writing the book that i wrote Mm -hmm. it was with that model in mind and i knew that you know you holding yourself in that warrior stance created space for me to reclaim my life Mm -hmm. right and 
I knew that the best way I could pay that forward was to emulate my teachers mm. and to lean into the tough spots. And so, sure, the book is about this notion of the leadership journey and what we can do to, to grow up with it. But really, the reason I needed to show up was everything else would feel like BS. Mm -hmm. And I, and you know me well enough to know that that's just, I'd, I'd rather be silent yeah, yeah, than to not be true. Yeah, I mean, why would we bother, you know, um, especially around that, you know, like. Well, I think be people, people don't bother <laughs> because it's scary. Yeah. But then those of us who have power and, you know, if you're given a book contract, you magically have power. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to read your words. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to hear your voice. Think of all the voiceless people in the world. Well, then we have an obligation to speak for the voiceless, yes. yeah. to show up in full catastrophe, as John Kabat-Zinn would yeah. say, right? Well, you did it beautifully, and it is not easy. It's definitely not easy. Oh, it was it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, because every I just, you know, one of my favorite poems, and a poem I quote often in the book, is Adrienne Rich's Diving into the Wreck. And she has a wonderful line there about... She uses the metaphor of diving into the, into the sea and going to the wreck of our lives. And the line that I love is the wreck itself, not the story of the wreck, but the wreck itself. And I dove into the wreck to excavate and pull out the treasures mm -hmm. and pull them back up to the surface, which meant that I was confronting shame. Mm -hmm. I was confronting fear, um, vulnerability. Not just like, what if people don't like this book, but what if people actually mock me? Mm -hmm. What if people make fun of me? What if people send me back to my boyhood in Brooklyn and beat me up, mm -hmm. right, for crying? And I stand with an open heart and a strong back. And I say that my tears are my superpower because they're a felt sense. They're an open heart. And if I've learned anything from teachers like you, Sharon, it's that bodhicitta, right? The, the open heart. The, 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 that's what heals the world. Mm. So there's a risk, but there's a risk in staying closed and, and being disconnected from other human beings. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you a quick story from yes, this week? Yes, please do. So earlier this week, I was at, speaking at this big tech conference and I was an anxious wreck. I was really, really a mess because... Not because I had to do a big, long talk for 700 people, but because I had to do a 10-minute TED-like talk. Mm -hmm. It was driving me crazy. Yeah, those are harder, actually. <laughs> they were so much hard. And I literally did not sleep for three yeah. nights. And I talked to my therapist, and I talked to my good friend, Seth Godin, who was like, just own it, just own it. And so anyway, just before going on, I was just so anxious. And I, and I stopped in a little shop to grab a little lunch and this young man comes up to me and I'm wearing a name badge and I'm all dressed up to go out on stage. And he very, very tenderly says, are, are, are you Jerry Colonna? And I said, I am. And he said, I am so happy to meet you. I, your podcast has been so helpful to me and all this because I wish I could sign up for your workshop, but it's sold out. And I, I just, I'm, I can't believe I'm meeting you. And I said, but just come to the workshop. Don't, don't worry. And so then he told me a little bit more of his story, and his name is Joel. And all of a sudden I realized, I just had to talk to Joel. Sure, there were 700 people in the room. That's right. But all I had to do was show up there and talk yeah, to Joel. That's right. And keep my heart open. And it was fine. That's beautiful. And it is true. It's always true for us. Mm -hmm. Um 
I'm glad you mentioned your podcast because it's oh. fabulous. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and I've been on it. Um, because that's that's the end of fear. You know, that's love. It's just talking to Joel. Just talking to Joel. You just talk to Joel. Just talk to Joel. And and literally, I looked out at 700 people, and I just found the Joels in the room. The scared, broken, open heart. And I just talked to him like a friend. Yeah. And all the fears just went away. Yeah. Yeah. It's too beautiful to see you. Oh. <laughs> talk to you. I just feel like crying. Um, <laughs> do you... Uh, want to lead us in a short reflection or sitting perhaps um i feel uncomfortable and okay. i will tell you why okay. i feel uncomfortable because you're my teacher yeah and i will say this can i evoke anipema Yes, please. So maybe this is not so much my teaching, but Ani Pema's teaching. Yeah. And I remember one time going to um, um, a teaching that she was leading, and we were sitting in a tent at a retreat center in Colorado, and there were probably 300 people, and it was super hot and all this stuff. And I remember asking her, because I was at the time working with some really painful memories from my childhood. And so the advice she gave at the time is what I would offer now. And the advice that she gave um, spoke to how to work with the pain that I was dealing with. And I'm thinking now of our earlier part of this conversation where we were talking about anxiety. And so perhaps we can take our seats and just sit and feel our way into our bodies and recognize the, the ground in which we sit upon, the earth that has always been there, that magically comes back every morning and holds us up. And as we sit, and we touch into those places of fear and that anxiety and that constant threat. There's an opportunity in that. And the opportunity, as Ani Pema taught, is to connect with all those other people who are feeling exactly what you're feeling. Not to fix their feelings, not to change their feelings, not to make them go away, but to be with their feelings. I think of that word, compassion, to be with feelings. And think of all the Joels who are out there worried about what tomorrow will bring. And we can remember what that feeling is like and we can be together and just be human together. We can't make those anxious thoughts go away. They're part of our humanity, but we don't have to be anxious and alone. Mm. Maybe that community can make the experience of the anxiety a little bit easier to be with. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. What an honor. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm honored. So happy to see you. Mm. And uh, for those listening, to learn more about Jerry's work, you can visit his website at 
rebootbyjerry.com. <laughs> it sounds like, I don't know, like an ice cream flavor or something. You know? <laughs> R-E-B-O-O-T-B-Y-J-E-R-R-Y.com. Yeah. And I encourage you to get a copy of his new book, Reboot, Leadership in the Art of Growing Up, which is available in hardcover, ebook, and audio book formats wherever books are sold. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com. <laughs>